God's plan during this season that we call Christmas. And so as we get busy, and as we encourage you to come and participate in different things, I hope you'll come tonight as we start what we may have as a new tradition, um, a variation, a maybe a much less... Um, I don't know, the word's not coming to me. Just a variation of the hanging of the green in the sense that it'll be made more for who we are and what we're doing. And so much of the decorating will be done this afternoon. If you have some free time at around 2 o'clock or a little after and you want to come up and help us hang the greenery and get the things out, we'd love to have your help doing that. And then tonight we'll actually light everything and we will decorate uh, the tree as we kind of focus around the gathering around the tree and that aspect of what that means. Because I want you to understand that when we gather at the cross, we're gathering at a tree. Started out as a tree and then was carved into that cross that held our Jesus there as he hung, dying for your sins and for mine. And so every time I look at our Christmas tree, I have an opportunity to be reminded that it paints a picture of a tree that birthed the cross, that held the Savior that was born as a baby and placed in a manger. I want you to find in your Bibles, if you would, Luke chapter 1. This will be our text for the next three Sundays as we look to this idea of how can we learn, what can we learn from the Christmas season? What can we learn from the messages of the Scripture about Christmas and how it came about that will help us make a difference for the Lord today? So we're going to look at this through the eyes and the thoughts of Mary and asking ourselves, how can we have a merry Christmas? Not the merry M-E-R-R-Y with a smile on our face and all of that. That ought to come naturally to us because of what Christmas is all about. Not whether or not we get the present we want or we give the present that everybody wants, but because of what happened on that Christmas day. But I want us to learn some lessons from Mary and how, what God teaches us through her and what she teaches us that will help us to really have a picture of Christmas and an understanding of what God's about through that story. So... The passage we're going to read is, this, is the passage in which Mary comes to know that she's going to be the mother of Jesus, the Savior of the world. She's the one person on earth that is closer to Jesus than anybody else. Because she knew him not only as Savior of the world, but as her son. She knew him not only as God Almighty, but also as that helpless little baby that she held in her arms. She, she had a connection with Jesus before any of us had a connection with Jesus. And so what are some lessons that we can learn from this lady, this mother of the Christ child, that will help us make a difference for the Lord today. Let's begin reading in chapter 1, verse 26. I think we have it on one screen if you want to just follow along on the screen. But here it says this. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Verse 31, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? <coughs> and the angel answered her, 
the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. In verse 38, And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, as we look to your word, may you help us uncover a simple truth gleaned from the life of Mary and the knowledge that she comes to hear that she is going to carry the Christ child. Help us, Father, to learn that truth. Help us to apply it in our lives. Help us ultimately, Father, to be as Mary was, willing to say yes to obediently follow God's plan. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lots of truths from this passage of Scripture, and the one truth we want you to get today is, no matter who you are, the Lord can use you. You need to hear that. No matter who you are, the Lord can use you. In fact, I might even take it just a little step further and say no matter who you are, not only can the Lord use you, but the Lord wants to use you. He is looking to use you. He has created you in such a way to use you. So I got to thinking. Brianna moved to Ada and in the process had to start filling out job applications and trying to find a new job and, and all of that. And it was amazing all the different questions that they ask you on an application. I mean, they're wanting to know everything there is to know about you, where you live, how long you've lived there. If you haven't lived there so long, where did you live before that? And then they want to know your education history and they want to know your job experience. And they just, they just want to know all of the things that there could possibly be to know about you. And then many of them are now asking a question or two within the midst of that application that, that maybe is something along this. What do you believe makes you uniquely qualified for this job or for this position? What, what are your abilities? What are your special traits? What, what makes you, what's going to make you excel above everybody else that we're interviewing for this job? You've filled out applications. Maybe you've encountered that. You, you students, as you, some of you, as you age and you get up and you start filling out those scholarships and all of that, that's gonna, there's going to be a similar question on those scholarship applications. Basically, why should we give you this scholarship over the hundred other applicants that are applying for that? What makes you special? What makes you better? What makes you the person that we ought to hire? See, because in the process of that job application, going back to that illustration, the employers are assuming that you're available or you wouldn't be filling out the application, right? They're, they're assuming that you, you want the job and that you believe you're available and you can, you can be there for it. But what they're really trying to figure out is, is what liabilities do you carry along? What, what are the things, what's the baggage that you carry? What are, what are some things that might make you unsuited for the job? What, what are the what are the negative sides that you bring along? And so they're, they're trying to figure out your liabilities. They're also trying to figure out your usability. What skills, what talents do you have that will help you do the job? And I paint that picture or attempt to because that's the way the world looks at things. The world assumes you're available and they want to know how able you are to do something. But when I look through Scripture and I look to this passage, I begin to see that God looks at things way different. God, God looks and He knows our abilities. You know why? He made us. He knows what you can do. He knows how He's equipped you. He knows the talents and the gifts. and He, he knows all of that. He's looking for our availability. In the midst of our busy lives, in the midst of everything that's going on, will we sit aside or will we stand up and say, God, here I am, I'm available. 
And so as Mary begins to show us no matter who you are, the Lord can use you, she teaches us that God's not interested in our abilities as much as he's interested in our availability. And so when you think about this truth that no matter who you are, God can use you, you have to begin to ask yourself, how available am I to the Lord? But we naturally begin to say, how could I do this? I can't do that. I can't do that. Hey, if God's talking to us and asking us to do something, guess what? He's already given us the ability to do it. He's just wanting to see if we're willing to say yes. And if we're willing to be available. And if you're going to have a Merry Christmas, you're going to gather and gain the truth that no matter who you are, the Lord can use you. And He's looking for your availability. Mary teaches us three things, or we can learn three things or truths about Mary. One of those is that she is young. The second is that she's poor. And the third is, is that she's from Nazareth. We can glean all that from this passage of Scripture. These would be the liabilities. These would be the excuses that you and I would use today. God, I can't because... And we fill in the line. God, there's, there's no way that I could do that because... And when, when we look at Mary, we could very quickly reason her out of the picture of even being somebody as to why in the world would God choose her. I mean, she's, she's young. The Scripture tells us that she's espoused or pledged to be married. She's engaged to be married. That'd be the term that we would use today. She, she's engaged and set aside to be married. And, and that was a, a thing that she is... She's somewhere between the ages of 13 and 16. And set aside and, and engaged to be married. That's young. How could, God, how could God use these students? Some of you ask that question. Why should we invest in them? Why should we do that? Why should... How? I'm just being real with you because I hear it. We begin to rationalize. They're too young. God over and over again in his scripture used young people. How old was David when David was set aside as the king? Teenager. Young man. God's in the business of doing what we don't think is reasonable. She's young. And yet Gabriel visited her and said, Hey, O favored one, the Lord is with you. In verse 28. He's, he's just, in, in, even in her state, we may think she's too young for God to use. She may have even thought she was too young for God to use, but God didn't think so. And then we know she's poor. We have to go to after the, the birth of Christ when they're going to present Jesus to be circumcised and all of that in chapter 2 and verse 22 through 24. We're not going to turn there. But Mary and Joseph take the baby Jesus to the temple. And the scripture teaches that when they bring that one to be presented at the temple, they're also to bring one of two different types of offerings. And those offerings are really dependent upon their social status and what they might have in terms of possessions and everything. So they're either to bring a lamb for the burnt offering or they're to bring a dove or a pigeon for that offering. If the lamb's too expensive, the parents could bring a second dove or a pigeon instead. And the scripture teaches us in Luke chapter 2 that when Mary and Joseph come and present baby Jesus at the temple, that they bring two doves because they couldn't afford a lamb. You and I might think that this family is too poor to be the ones to provide Jesus, the Savior of the world, to the world. But apparently Jesus, apparently Jesus' Father, God, didn't think so. And sometimes we think, man, I don't have the means. How could God use me? I just don't have the resources 
And we think, why invest in this person or that person? They're not going to benefit. Or how could I help? All I have is two little mites. Just, just maybe a penny's worth. You want to have a Merry Christmas, you need to realize that God can use you no matter what. And your age, whether it be on the young scale or that other side that I'm getting closer to, that not so young stage where things crick and bone, you know, snap and everything every time you get up. Don't think you're too old for God to use either. Or too poor or insignificant in the sense of what you have. But the third thing that we see here is the scripture also tells us that she was from Nazareth. Now, what's the big deal about being from Nazareth? Very interesting. Nazareth was not a, a, a religious city at this time. It wasn't a place in which there were churches and lots of things going on. I mean, it wasn't where there was a lot of, a, of spiritual talk going on. It wasn't that type of a location. And isn't it interesting that God chose to bring Jesus into the world into a place that would, would not have that type of dynamic to it. But for, for the sake of this lesson, Nazareth, for you and I, have you ever heard the phrase or thought of the idea that that person's just from the wrong side of the tracks? They're just, they're just from the wrong side of town? They couldn't, nothing good comes out of there. I mean, there's just trouble. That's the way Nazareth was looked at by the surrounding communities. There's nothing good. In fact, you can go to that passage in John chapter 1 where, where they're being called out and Nathaniel actually asks as he's being persuaded to come and see this Jesus, he actually says, hey, can anything good come from Nazareth? That was just the mindset and, the, and the, the look that the people of that day gave and they had for Nazareth. So she's, she's poor, she's young, and she's from a city and a town where everybody says, can anything good come from there? Is, is there anything worthwhile that city's got a bad reputation. All of those characteristics seem to make her unusable by God. And yet God looks beyond the social status. God looks beyond the age. God looks beyond the city and the location in which she is from. And he says, that's the girl. She's favored. Not because of what she's done. We'll look at this a little bit more in the weeks to come. It's not because of what she's done, but because of what I'm going to do through her. I think there's folks that preach a different gospel today. And we're favored because of what we've done. And they lose sight that when he calls her favored right here, she is favored because of what he's going to choose to do through her. You want to be favored today, it's going to be because you get to the point that you say, here I am, God, I'm available. I'm your servant. No matter what, you can use me. And I make myself available. And what he does through us brings that about. So again, more of that to come. So where are you this morning? What excuse are you throwing up to God to keep you from having a Merry Christmas? too young I'm too old I've already done it somebody else's turn that all fits into that age ramification and that picture I've already given of my resources at somebody else's turn or I don't have enough to give that would make a difference ask one of those kids that's going to receive a shoebox in the months to come when they pray to receive Christ because you helped a church put together shoe boxes or you put one together and ask them if your 7 or 10 or 15 or 20 dollars or 2 dollars makes a difference to them because now they're going to heaven 
because of what you've done. Hey, sometimes we lose sight and we can't look at things the way that God looks at things. We sit there and say we're not usable because of all of these things and we begin to throw that excuse out and that excuse out at God and, and that to everybody and it just, man, I just, I just, I was too rough growing up, man. I've done too much. God could never use me. None of those excuses stand because in the midst of this, God looking over his creation for the woman that he was going to choose to bring his son to this earth. All of these liabilities that she brought with her. And we didn't really even get them all. We'll get to some others. I mean, she's, she's not going to be pregnant without being married and all of those kind of things. And how does that... See? And yet God chooses her. And she gets to the point in her, so God, here I am. Who am I to sit there and say no to you if you're choosing to use me? Am I worthy? No, but I'm available. Out of all the queens and the princes and the daughters of the wealthy and the influential, God chooses a poor teenager from a town with a bad reputation to be the mother of Jesus. But she had two characteristics that God looks for. He looks for humility, and he looks for faith. And when he looked down, he saw both of those things in her life. Are those evident in your life? She knew she wasn't worthy of the honor that he offered to her. But yet she believed God could use her. She trusted in him. She obediently said yes. And she teaches us that no matter who you are, God can use you. Would you stand with me this morning? What's God asking you to do for Him right now? If you're here today and you've never trusted Him as Savior and Lord, why not? What excuse are you throwing up? God could never use me. Yeah, He can. He's using me. He can use you. He wants you. He sent His Son Jesus to be born in a stable, ultimately to die on a cross for you. So if you've never trusted Him as Savior and Lord, I invite you to make that choice and decision today and to say yes to Him. And if you've made that choice and decision and you know that Jesus is your Savior and heaven is your home, then what excuse are you throwing out to Him to keep from serving Him today? I'm too poor. I'm too young. I'm too old. I've got too much. I've done my share. What excuse? God just looks at that and says, Man, it's because of those things that I want to use you. Because then I get the glory for what happens in and through your life and you can't take the credit for it. So could you just say, God, I realize no matter who I am, what I've done, you can use me. And my response to you today, Lord, is I'm available. I'm available. You come as we sing. Secret in the quiet place In the stillness